give me a couple of minutes on your last week in the Moonies. The last week in the Moonies. Before you were Ray. Kidnapped. Okay. I was working on a project uh, to start an elementary school under a front group, front name called the Durst School to brainwash little children. What name? The Durst School. Death, D -E Durst, D -E Durst, D-U-R-S-T. That's what? the name of the, the leader out there, the so-called famous psychologist. Uh, and uh, if you wanted to enroll your, your kids in a nice f private school in San Francisco, you might enroll them there, not knowing that all the teachers were Moonies, uh, the principal was Mooney, and the whole design was to convert them, to brainwash them. And if you were invited by a very friendly teacher to come to an educational seminar uh, through the Parents Association, you might find yourself up in the same training camp I went to. And of to. course, anybody who dares to interfere with these Moonies is guilty of an attack on religious freedom. Oh, that's right. They can do just about anything by creating a smoke screen uh, that uh, there's a threat of the separation between church and state. You're not allowed to do a, a traditional investigation of the group that you would do with any group that does alleged criminal were activity. You, were you at this stage now being treated more gently, being given I some money? I was being treated very, very nicely. Uh, after months of humiliation, uh, being browbeaten, uh, being uh, attacked by people, uh, not being allowed to eat or to determine anything, I was suddenly put in a position where I had a lot of power where uh, I could boss around people the same way I was bossed around. Were you not selling roses anymore? I wasn't selling roses. Instead of uh, starving, I was having nice steak dinners with the leader. Uh, I was, uh, they were giving me clothing and uh, being extremely nice to me. Car? Uh, I had use of a car, yes, and uh, occasionally people would drive me around, whereas before anything I'd do, I'd have to run. And were you doing this brainwashing of other youngsters? Not of, not of other youngsters. I was assigned to take care of the children of the leader because they were so badly abused and so neglected during their lives. They were flunking out of school, they were having nightmares of demons attacking them, and so I was supposed to be their father, because the leader was too busy being the father of the 35-year-olds. Before I forget, with your hand. Okay. Uh, an example, uh, when I was on the farm, I guess it was the end of the second week, uh, I, was, I was told uh, that if I worked for the sake of God, if I worked hard, then I would become closer and we could understand this faith better. I worked with a pick, picking a, a trail with a group of young people, singing along la di da choo, choo, choo. That's right. I, would, I broke open my hand, the blisters got infected, and my hand started to swell. Well, they said that was because of my satanic life, that if I'm more faithful and work harder, and it's part of the theology, if you work harder by... Perfectly Demi, correct. It was the evil spirits coming it's out the evil in spirits. You. So I would work harder and work harder. It's a testimony of the type of brainwashing that had already taken place. Finally, my hand got so swollen, I was in so much pain that I complained. Of course, they, they said that was being small-minded to complain. Here I was, I'm a doctor's son. Now, I have some sort of basic medical knowledge. I knew that this was going to destroy me. Finally, I complained loud enough that they took me to the emergency room. The surgeon in the emergency room looked at it and told me, he, he shook his head and said, he may have to amputate. Uh, finally, he, he tried to drain it. He was managed to drain the pus and all the fluid, and he wrapped it and said that if I had come 24 hours later, he would have amputated. And there were other if this people had happened there. six weeks later, I wouldn't have gone to the hospital. You talked about a woman who her legs were covered with open sores. That's right. I had strep throat for two months in the group, and they only let me go to the doctor after I passed out. What? Uh, where were you when you were kidnapped by your father? I was in a, a little house that um, a number of Moonies didn't even know existed in the group. It was where some of the people in the front groups worked. San Francisco? This was in Oakland on Regent Street. Why do you uh, I was supposed that? to move into the mansion of the leaders the following week, so my, fa my father thought that something was going wrong. He, s he sensed in my conversation that, that I might be moved. You mean you had spoken to him on the telephone? I kept in touch with him, yes. He was in New Jersey? Yes. Well, you, you're supposed to keep in touch with your parents, whom you're separated oh, tell from. tell them oh, I'm happy. And everything That's right. Wonderful, wonderful helping, oh, helping yes, people. Uh -huh. That's right. So, so that they don't deprogram you, and so that you can convert them eventually. So I said I was going to move into this estate a week later, in which case my father would have never gotten me because it has such it has a guards and, and gates and walls. My father had me kidnapped uh, by a team of people. I was deprogrammed by Ted Patrick and, and half a dozen other deprogrammers in a hotel room about an hour away. And uh, essentially what they were trying to do, first to separate me from the group, to convince me that it's okay to question, that I won't be possessed, that the deprogrammers won't beat me, which is of course the, the things that the people in the cult tell you about, to get me to stop chanting, because you can tell when you've been in the group when someone's chanting, you can tell by their eyes, the changes in their faces, uh, to get, they were trying to get me to listen to them and to think about what I had been through. Do you remember the deprogram? Yeah, very clearly. Well, I remember when Patrick uh, looked at me and pointed to my father and said, would you kill your father if Moon had ordered you to? I remember just shaking my head and getting very upset because I knew I would have. Tell us up here who Patrick is. Ted Patrick? 
Uh, Ted Patrick is a man who had worked in the California government who uh, found out uh, that his son had been meeting with these uh, young people and suddenly had been undergoing all these changes in his own mind and his emotions. He came out with glassy eyes. Patrick investigated it, found out it was Children of God, the cult in California. Uh, he almost got caught in the cult itself. He got out, and uh, apparently he found out that there are other young people getting involved with these things. So he so started now, deprogramming He's people. now a professional deprogrammer. Yeah. How long did it take to deprogram Christopher Edwards? It took four days for me to initially have enough insight and to feel enough support in the outside world that I'd be willing to question. To realize, and after going through this, I'd lost my memories of my past. You know, I lost my identity with my family. I lost my entire identity before the group because they had pushed it farther and farther away in the recesses of my mind. What did it cost your father? In I money, know. not... I don't know, but it, it was very, very expensive. Because he had to come out from New Jersey, yeah. hire Patrick. How That's many right. people were guarding People there? flown in, uh, and I had a guard for the next four months. My whole family had a guard. Are you still... Do you still believe that you're in some kind of a danger? Uh, I think I'm in a fairly serious danger, but I, I, I take very good security precautions. But Moon, My life was threatened, I told you that before. But Moon himself would not in any way, shape, or form be involved with that. Is it not a question that it's the, the people within this organization who regard you as some kind of antichrist who would yeah, act on I'm their own Yeah, I'm motives? considered to be satanic because I, I'm, I'm, in the book I'm telling the truth about the movement, about how people are brainwashed and what they really believe, their political motives, and how dedicated they are. That's the greatest threat to the group. Um, how do you f are you not still a bit bent, a bit twisted? No, I don't think so. Clean as a whistle now. Oh, I hope so, yeah. Are you the first one to write this story of the nightmare of cult life by an ex-moon disciple? Yeah, I'm not only the first moon, either, but the first person from an American cult, major cult. And I think out. the processes of brainwashing are very similar in, in all the cults. Do you see, but there's no way that you, with one single boot, are going to get at these people who, if there is if Well, the attempt is not to get at people uh, so much as to help the people who are in cults and who are coming out. So There's a tremendous misunderstanding about what a person goes through and makes it very, very difficult to adjust in the real world afterwards because of that. When you first were picked up on the street in San Francisco, you weren't worried about money, but you had no need for money thereafter. Is that correct? When I was in the cult? Mm -hmm. Well, they supported me, sure, but I was making a tremendous amount of money for them. What is the status in the United States today of, and you've written this book on it, of uh, Sun Myung Moon. He's from well, South Korea. He's is from he? South Korea. He's managed to uh, influence not only major American po uh, politicians, congressmen, but also as a uh, witness in the theological and academic community. He has Nobel laureates working for him. These are not just, these are not just kids. You begin, you begin to sound a little paranoid to me myself. You I can mean, check. Are you trying to tell uh, me that Sun I'm not Myung, paranoid. Sun Myung Moon wields considerable influence in the United States well, today? If he made over $100 million a year last year in America, which I believe he, he did, uh, that itself is considerable influence. He has lobbying groups in Washington. Uh, the Fraser Subcommittee of Congress has come out with a very, very damaging report saying he's violated numerous laws. Uh, they, they claim that uh, there's a document in the report that says that the Unification Church was founded by the Korean CIA in Korea. Uh, there are Tremendous implications, have you ever seen possibilities this? of involvement with the Korean man? Moon? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he sneaked in uh, in Berkeley one morning, early one morning, because this is a front group that denies that they're involved with the Unification Church. And uh, he spoke for about four hours. He ranted and raved and kicked and chopped at imaginary demons in the air. And here we were, 400 of us sitting on the floor like little kids, kind of smiling, looking up at Father, thinking this is the most important man in the history of the world. Uh, it was absolutely insane. If anybody could see fear, that, they'd be convinced Do you it was fear for the, what you obviously regard as the evil influence of a man like Moon to well, this very day? Well, what do you do? What do you think about a man who can completely control the lives of people, who has a political theology of, what is of World War III, oh, established a heavenly kingdom under Moon, uh, where he would be establish a dynasty for the next thousand years where his kids and his kids' children would, would rule, where people are absolutely obedient, ready to die or to kill, Tremendous amount of money invested in this. It's a totalitarian move. If I were a Moon disciple, I would be willing to accept and be waiting eagerly for the World War III. So no, I'm... you're already in it, according to them. Well, now. This is the end of it. Christopher Edwards talked with uh, Jack Webster, and his book is called again, Fred, anybody? Crazy, crazy. crazy for God. Jack hopefully will be here in the flesh in the next couple of days. For the next few minutes at least, uh, I'm Fred Latrimo. 
and uh, I'll be doing my best to fill in for Jack. My next guest after this commercial break is a man who you probably read every night. If you're anything like me, you may read him first. I think that's a tradition that's happened in this town over a period of years. He's Denny Boyd, and we'll find out uh, what's going on in town and how he finds out about it after this commercial break. <laughs> With me now is a well-known columnist and friend of mine and a tennis rival, uh, Denny Boyd. And Denny, uh, you've been welcome, first of all. Thank you, Fred. You have inherited uh, a rather difficult uh, role, really. Uh, you, you inherited the, the role that, uh, that Jack Wasserman uh, almost made legendary over a period of years. How's it been getting involved in it uh, for the last couple of years? It, uh, it took me a while to get back to feeling comfortable with it uh, initially. And I was just starting to get comfortable with it. And we had an eight-month vacation. But yes. uh, I'm beginning to feel comfortable with it now. Uh, and I, when I say feel comfortable, I'm feeling confident that uh, I don't have that great aching, panicky feeling in the morning that uh, this is the day it's not going to happen. There's nothing to write about. Danny, uh, uh, it's not really a big secret. You're a non-drinker. Mm -hmm. uh, have been successfully for, for a number of years. Mm -hmm. One of the few people to do it on your own. How do you uh, put the kind of work that you do, which involves, uh, I, anytime I see you, it's usually a nightclub opening or you're, you're at all those kinds of things, and usually booze is one of the common denominators in those kinds of places. And uh, uh, how do you manage to, to keep your lifestyle clean and do your thing and, and, and uh, get around and get all this gossip from these smoky places? Just say no. Just say uh, coffee, Schweppes, plain, whatever. Um, and you just don't tell anybody that I haven't had any fun for 10 years. We were talking. <laughs> <laughs> Not true. No, you just say no, which is... Yeah. Okay. No, I, I don't. Uh, good God, if you, had to, if you had to drink to write a newspaper column, uh, there'd be very few daily newspapers in Canada. I guess what I'm getting at is, is the lifestyle uh, pretty vigorous, pretty rigorous? Uh, is it hard on you? I know Jack Wasserman used to, it, it appears to me... Fred, uh, it can be if you let it get away with you. If you don't, if you don't discipline your, your hours and come in at, in the daytime, uh, like I usually come in around noon, and uh, you have to have an idea of what you're going to be doing because you can't go somewhere and wait for the column to come to you. All right, I, I think perhaps people assume that, you, that uh, a columnist goes to a bar and sits there and waits until everybody in the world walks by him and says something. You don't do that. You can't well, possibly do that. That's what I want to know. How do, how do you do it? How does Denny Boyd's day begin? Uh, and where do you get your information? Do you spend a lot of time on the phone? Oh, yes, yes. An awful lot of time on the phone. That's the, that's the, uh, the glamorous life of the columnist is spent on the telephone. That's where the, the effective work is done. As I say, to, that's the active way of doing it. The passive way is to go to uh, all the openings, go to around bars, and wait, hoping that someone is going to come along and tell you the big consummate item. It doesn't work that way. How much information do you get that can't be verified and therefore you won't use, or information that you might get that might be uh, uh, harmful to an individual, and you could use it, but you decide not to? A great deal. Mm -hmm. A great deal. Usually, um, what you have to do is, first of all, before you analyze the information, you analyze the person who's giving it to you. Do people like to tell you stories? Oh, yes. They tell you and stories they hoping they'll get their own name in the column as well? Usually? No. Uh, the, the ones you have to watch for is the people who tell you something because they're hoping to get someone else's name in, in, the, in the paper. Give me an example, not using any names. Do you have, a, do you have any problems, for, for, for example, with... Uh, uh, with well-known celebrities who you might uh, print something about and who then will snub you or will be upset oh, yes. or anything like oh, that. Yes. There's, a, there's a few people in um, few people in radio, uh, old friends of mine are talking to me these days. Uh, uh, you get politicians that get angry with you for a little while. But uh, that's, that's a pretty good measurement of them. But as I say, the thing you have to watch out for is why is that person telling me this? And you have to think that through first because uh, they, pro they usually have a vested interest. Uh, perhaps boosting themselves or sinking someone else. Listen, we haven't got a great deal of time here, so what I'd like to do is get back to the telephones and get some feedback to you about your column. Uh, obviously, you get this from the sure. people who you talk with on a day-to-day -day basis. Anybody got any items? Uh, okay, maybe we'll have an item or two, but uh, we'll have to watch that closely. I don't even know the telephone number. Here it is. Our number is 420-3336, and I think this is a chance for you to find out what people are thinking. Are you giving them enough information? Is there enough... Uh, uh, black names in there that they can go to. I always yeah. scan it and I say, who's interesting here first? Mm -hmm. Maybe other people will tell you how they read you and uh, what they'd like to see more of. You did an interesting column the other day on how you don't want people to shake your hand. Or say, or have a nice day. <laughs> All right. What do you think of Boyd and his column? Let's have some feedback to him at 420-3336 or long distance, and you're certainly read throughout the province. Uh, collect at 420-5525. We'll be right back.
guest these last few minutes is Denny Boyd. Your chance to talk to him, give him your uh, personal view of the column, tell him what you like, what you don't like, what we used to call in radio in the old days, like beefs and bouquets, or <laughs> whatever. Hello, line one. Go ahead to Denny. Hi. Hi. Just want to tell you your column is great. Thank you. Are you free for lunch? <laughs> and he's single, too, are you? Sure. I think, I, yes, I, I am free for lunch. I think I know who that is. Oh, great. Must tell you well, also a good that start. not only are you single, but you're firmly committed to not being married. This is true. Ever this is again. true. The caller knows that. You know this caller? <laughs> yes, I know that caller. This is old home week. Yes. Thanks for calling. Yeah. Bye. Are you free for lunch? Yes, I am. <laughs> Go ahead to Danny Boyd. Uh, Mr. Boyd? Yes, sir. I like your caller, Mike. I haven't stopped laughing, but have a good day. It always reminds me of New Year's Eve and... People tell you how good you are, they won't talk to you all year after. <laughs> That's a right. Good job, That's and right. God bless you. Don't you think he's kind of a Scrooge? I mean, what's the matter with shaking hands when you meet somebody? No, no, I didn't mean that. I meant that uh, it's when some people come around and say, I'd like to have a good day, and they say, well, happy new year, and all the best to you, and then you meet them in the street, they don't know you. And I keep up a good That's job, they're doing wonderful. Thank you very much. See, Danny, nobody's mad at you yet. Not yet. Hello, go ahead, line three. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, Benny Point? Yes, ma'am. Uh, that uh, column of yours on Have a Nice Day just cuts the spot, as far as I was concerned. The first time it was said to me was by a taxi driver, and he was taking me into the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, thanks, I needed that. <laughs> right. Well, I watched Fred do the weather last night, and he closed off his weather report by I saying, I said, have a good have day. Have a good day. And have you looked outside? Today, well, like, it stop. doesn't work, Fred. It's polite. <laughs> yeah, but just being work. polite doesn't. Work. Any criticisms, ma'am? Anything you'd like to have Denny include that he doesn't include now, or anything that uh, you feel he could be covering, or something that a man of his talent should be getting into? We'll come back to that question. Okay. I missed it, I guess. Four two zero thirty three thirty six is the telephone number to Denny Boyd. Hello, go ahead. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, I would like, I really like your, your column very much, but I, I wish you would do an um, article on why city investigate, why city council, after watching Christopher Edward, why did city council grant a license for the Moonies to sell candles from door to door in Vancouver? The, uh, that really say, say again, why, why city council granted a license, a license for the Moonies, Moonies to, to sell what? candles? Yes, they, to sell it was candles. In, in, yeah. the, in the sun. I'll look into it. Pardon? I'll look into it. I, I sure wish you would, because after seeing Christopher Edwards down there, which I, that's the mm -hmm. second time I've seen him now on, on Webster's, and it really disturbs me because there's a lot of young people out there that would, you know, that would contribute to these candles. If they come to my door, they'll get a welcome they'll never want again, I'm telling you. I guess that's the essence. We still live in a free society. You can't yeah, yeah. Uh, not grant council, not, council would have to have a pretty, pretty strong reason to say, no, you can't have a, uh, a license. Yeah. yeah. And, okay, uh, anyway, have tip. a nice day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I knew you were going to get that. Uh, line one, go ahead to Denny. Oh, hello. Good morning. Good morning. It's, uh, it's about a site for that new stadium. Mm -hmm. You know, that uh, looked funny to me that nobody ever thought of uh, the old uh, city dump between Kerr, Marine, and Boundary Road. That, that site belonged to the city, and uh, it makes a damn good site. Plenty of room. What about this now, Denny? You haven't printed anything on it recently. Now no. we have the uh, provincial government coming back saying, let's have a site study. Yeah, right. Uh, we have uh, the mayor uh, saying everything. Multi multiplexes yeah. down the toilet. Um, yeah. the, uh, the people that are advocating the downtown stadium are still spelling Irwin Swangard's name wrong in all, their, in all their press releases. How can you take them too seriously? The whole thing is the worst political mishmash I've ever seen in my life. It, it, when, you, when you analyze the people who are involved, every one of them has a political motive. Except Swangard. How about no. Al Davidson? Uh, I think he wants to go to Ottawa. Okay. He's he's run for no. I no. I think Al uh, is probably non-political, but he's got. Uh, he, I mean, he's not. He's certainly going to be favor involved. the PNE oh, in a big yes. way. Yes. I don't know what he's what he said the last couple of days, because his project is is down the dump. You think Harry Hammer should uh, should be able to open his place on Sunday? Oh, certainly. Yeah. All right. Hello, line two. Go ahead to Denny. Hello. Good morning, gentlemen. Good, good morning. morning. Good morning. Hello, Denny. Hello. How are you? Fine, thank you. Jolly good. Um, I really enjoyed your sports column when you were writing for the Sun. Oh, that was a long time ago. Well, <laughs> I'm a long time ago. And I'm also, uh, I think, enjoying your um, column that you're doing now. But may I say just one thing to you? Yes, please do. Have a nice day. Uh -huh. Bye. I knew it. 
I'm gonna get a few of those, I think. I'll tell you one thing that I'm wondering about is sometimes I can't find you. <laughs> and uh, I'm wondering why the uh, sun, and perhaps this is something you, you can discuss, why, the, why they would put you one place one day and another place the next. I, I like the old second front page thing that, that Jack had where you knew exactly where you were going to yeah, find Yeah, that was home. traditional, but the, um, the format of the paper now is to have no blank break pages. The break page is the, the front the facing page on every section. Mm. Now, the old format you usually had two front pages, section fronts, which were classified advertising, which are not visually appealing. Mm -hmm. Now every break page is a theme page, and I'm rather in favor of that, even though I get dumped inside and sometimes I can't find it either. But I think the basic idea of having a cover on every break page is a good one. I think it it's, uh, makes the, the paper more uh, appealing from an eye, a visual point of view. It just, unfortunately, it, uh, it works somewhat to the detriment of the columnists and that we're all pushed inside. But I, I mean, I'm in the paper every day. Uh, I mean, I'm there somewhere. They have to hunt for you a bit sometimes. But I, I rather like the idea of the, the new look of the paper, the, the, the section sections being uh, busy. Okay. Go ahead to Denny Boyd, line three. Good morning, Denny. Good morning. Listen, uh, this is your friendly bus driver talking to you. Yeah. How would you like to do a column on the stress and strain of being a bus driver, the problems of the transit system in the lower mainland, and anything else you can sink your teeth into? Sure, why not? Why don't you, why don't you call me at my office? Can you, come, can you come and ride with you? Oh, definitely. Well, what, you're at the Vancouver Sun? Yeah. Very good. Thank Please you, sir. Do. From Victoria, go ahead. Hi, uh, Denny. Good Hello, morning. Vi Hello, Victoria. I, uh, I, I feel a little bit, uh, and I'm sure you're doing the same kind of column now, but I feel a little bit bad that uh, Jack Wasserman didn't uh, get as much recognition uh, after his passing that I, I really felt he should have. And, uh, you know, I'm not... Had a, had a street named after him. Pardon? Had a street named after him. Oh, yeah, no, I know. But I, I, I feel in the media itself that, uh, you know, and I'm not comparing apples and oranges with you and him or whatever, but uh, I think the guy contributed uh, a hell of a lot, to, well, you know. contributed a lot to the uh, to the city and an awful lot to the Vancouver Sun. No and I think he took that. a lot of kicking, too. Yeah, yeah. Sir, we have to go. We've run out of time. Yeah, and okay. uh, I, do you appreciate what Denny's doing as well now? Yeah, I certainly do. Thanks for calling. Those were big shoes to fill. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for coming, Danny. We're friend. out of time. And uh, please don't, something don't, will be Please here. don't say it. Huh? Please don't say don't it. Don't have a nice day. Have uh, a terrible day. Right. And Jack, you have a good day, and you get feeling better soon. It's been a pleasure filling in for you, and I hope uh, something will be here tomorrow morning. What? Break. We'll be back after this. On the noon show today, watch for it because pornography is the subject. There's a big conference at SFU. I'll be back tomorrow morning. My pleasure, Fred Lattermore for Jack Webster. Good morning.